Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for coming out for this talk, even on such a rainy, awful day. <laughs> um, I would just like to say a few words of thanks uh, before I introduce Dorothy Roberts, who will be introducing our speaker today. Um, today's talk from Professor Ruha Benjamin is a collaboration across three groups at Penn, the Department of History and Sociology of Science, the speaker series on control society that's run by Ezekiel Dixon Roman, um, who is associate professor with the School of Social Policy and Practice, but who is unfortunately not with us today and sends his regards, and also with Penn's, uh, by Penn's program on race, science, and society, which is chaired by Professor Dorothy Roberts. Uh, and when I wrote to Ruha to ask if she'd be willing to come to Penn to speak in our colloquium, she immediately responded to say yes, but indicated uh, that she had already been, vi been invited by these several other groups at Penn. And I think it speaks to the importance and the urgency of her work uh, that so many people are interested to hear from her. I understand she's given more than 60 talks this year, which makes me feel dizzy. And we are so grateful to be among them. And I am personally very grateful to have had this opportunity to bring some of the members of these different communities together at Penn. Uh, indeed, I think the pressing questions raised by technoscience and artificial intelligence today require that we have conversations across communities, both scholarly and otherwise. So a co-sponsored event in this occasion felt most fitting. Um, a few other brief thanks. Jessa Lingel, who's here. Jessa, hello. <laughs> Thank you. Is a postdoc at the Annenberg for School for Communication. And Izel Sanford III is a postdoc in Africana Studies here at Penn. Um, both of them helped us out a great deal with the organizing and logistics of this event. And I would also like to thank Courtney Brennan, who is the Administrator for History and Sociology of Science, uh, who did a great deal of work for logistics and uh, coordinating the reception, to which you are all invited after the talk today. Um, I would also like to say thanks and introduce our two interpreters, Donna Alice and Jay Wexler, who will be translating the talk today into sign language. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Dorothy Roberts, who will introduce our speaker. Dorothy is a George A. Weiss University Professor of Law and Sociology and the Raymond Pace and Sadie Tanner Mossel Alexander Professor of Civil Rights. Uh, she's also a Professor of Africana Studies and she's the Director for the Program on Race, Science and Society and has known Ruha for a very long time and there's no one better to introduce her today. So please welcome Dorothy and thank you all. Thank you. Thanks, Stephanie, for that uh, welcome and for all of your work uh, bringing this together. I'm so happy to see so many people from all across the campus. No surprise, because Ruha Benjamin's work is so important to the work that we're all doing. And it's been great to collaborate with uh, our co-hosts on this project. So I uh, was really, really thrilled to bring, to help to bring uh, Dr. Benjamin back to Penn and to have this opportunity to introduce her to you this afternoon. I think she is one of the most insightful and inspiring scholar activists analyzing the relationship between cutting edge technologies and social justice in our fields today. She's an associate professor in the Department of African American Studies at Princeton where she studies and teaches about how the social dimensions of science, technology, and medicine intersect with race and racism, citizenship, and power. She's also the founder of the Just Data Lab, and she serves as a faculty associate and executive committee member on a number of Princeton programs that are related to her work. You no doubt know Dr. Benjamin, for her pathbreaking books, two of which were published just this year uh, and are already making their way into uh, syllabi at dozens of universities. And uh, as uh, Stephanie said, her uh, talks are really popular all around the country and the world. Uh, her first book, People, Science, Bodies, and Rights on the Stem Cell Frontier, released in 2013, investigates the social life of stem cell science with a particular focus on the passage and implementation of a related uh, law, a set of legislation in California. It happened that I was serving on the standards working group of the California Center for Regen Institute for Regenerative Medicine, which is the fancy word for stem cell research, at the time that uh, Dr. Benjamin's book came out, 
uh, that was basically the ethics board overseeing the billions of dollars that California taxpayers voted to spend on stem cell research, by the way, when they denied funding for people with disabilities that same year. And I was thrilled that Dr. Benjamin shared my concerns about the need to democratize how public science is funded, performed, and contested. Captivating technology, race, carceral, technoscience, and liberatory imagination in everyday life is an edited volume, which as I said was just released this year, that explores the interplay between innovation and containment across a wide variety of social and historical arenas, including policing, prisons, and the workplace. Uh, thank you, Ruha, for including me in that uh, amazing collection. And her latest book, which you'll talk about today, uh, is Race After Technology, Abolitionist Tools for the New Jim Crow, which in addition to having the coolest cover, let's see if I don't have my sunglasses on, but the uh, <laughs> coolest cover ever, uh, is the most exciting and comprehensive analysis of the relationship between artificial intelligence and racism. Like all her work, Race After Technology not only reveals the discriminatory design embedded within supposedly race-neutral technologies, but it also offers a social justice approach and the tools for developing technologies that are liberating. Dr. Benjamin says the tension between innovation and equity is what keeps her up at night. And uh, Ruha, we all benefit from your tireless <laughs> night and day work on how to uncover the way techno-scientific innovations reproduce past injustices and leading us in how to transform techno-science for a more equitable future. So thank you, Ruha, for your brilliant work and for enlightening us this afternoon. Dr. Benjamin. <laughs> I love you too. Thank you so much for coming out in the rain. It's a thrill to be here. It's a thrill to see so many faces of people who I know and love. I was a grad student at Berkeley when I heard Professor Roberts come and speak, and I've been following in her footsteps ever since. So it's an honor to be here. And I want to thank Professor Dick for reaching out to me so many months ago, it was a no-brainer to come back and uh, be in conversation with you here. I really enjoyed um, my visit, um, I think it was last year or the year before, I can't remember, and so it was a very easy to work in to my calendar. And all of the co-sponsors for today, the History and Sociology of Science, um, Professor Roberts' program on race and science, Annenberg, and the Control Societies group. Um, Dr. Lingle, Dr. Sanford, thank you so much, everyone, for what you've done to get us in this room. Please join me now in acknowledging that the land on which we gather is the unceded and traditional territory of the Lenape. Let us also acknowledge the intertwined legacies of settler colonialism and transatlantic slavery, which contribute to the creation and continued wealth of this university and of the nation. We acknowledge the reparations owed to black and indigenous peoples and communities and the impossibilities of return for generations past. Let us also acknowledge the ancestors in the room today as we fight together for better futures. We're alive in an era of awakening and mobilization to preserve this planet and all the beautiful creation that is no doubt worthy of the struggle. Ashe. With that, let me begin with a recent experience I had being a nosy sociologist, walking by two men in Newark International Airport. When I overheard one say to the other, I just want someone I can push around, dot, dot, dot. I didn't stick around to see how the sentence ended, but I could imagine all types of endings. It could be in the context of looking through resumes, deciding who to hire. I just want someone to push around in the context of work, or in the context of dating or marriage. I just want someone I can push around in my personal life. The desire to exercise power over others is a dominant mode of power that has been given new license to assert itself, a kind of power that requires others to be subordinate. 
At the time, I was traveling to speak with students at Harvey Mudd College about issues of technology and power. And so when I overheard this conversation, I couldn't help but think of this advertisement from 1957, Mechanics Illustrated. The robots are coming. And when they do, you'll command a host of push-button servants. And then it says, in 1863, Abe Lincoln freed the slaves. But by 18, 1965, slavery will be back. We'll all have personal slaves again. Don't be alarmed. We mean robot slaves. So much going on in this one little page, isn't there? We could talk about it for an hour. But for the sake of time, there are just a few things I'll point out. The first, of course, is just this date, 1957, a time when those who were pushed around in the domestic sphere, wives, domestic servants, could no longer be counted on in the same way to, quote, dress you, comb your hair, and serve you meals in a jiffy. Hence the desire to replace free and cheap labor in the home with push-button robots. The fact is, no technology is preordained but rather the broader context makes some inventions appear desirable and inevitable. Perhaps even more telling is that we will all have personal slaves again. That one little word tells us something about the targeted audience of the ad. Certainly not those who are the descendants of people who were enslaved the first time. The imagined user is gendered, raced, and classed without gender, race, or class ever mentioned. Code words, in this case, encode interlocking systems of inequality as part of the design process. Precisely by ignoring social reality, tech designers will almost certainly reproduce it. True in 1957 and true today. With that, let me offer three provocations as a kind of trailer for the talk in case anyone needs to leave early or you get bored or your notifications start going off your phone. You'll at least know what I want you to know. First, racism is productive, not in the sense of being good, but in the literal capacity of racism to produce things, a value to some even as it wreaks havoc on others. We're taught to think of racism as an aberration, a glitch, an accident, an isolated incident, a bad apple, in the backwoods, and outdated, rather than as innovative, systemic, diffuse, an attached incident, the entire orchard, in the ivory tower, forward-looking, productive. In sociology, we like to say race is socially constructed, but we often fail to state the corollary that racism constructs. Secondly, I'd like us to think about the way that race and technology shape one another. More and more people are accustomed to thinking about the social and ethical impact of technology, but that's only half of the story. Social norms, values, and structures all exist prior to any given tech development. So it's not simply the impact of technology that we're gonna talk about, but the social inputs that make some inventions appear inevitable and desirable, which leads to a third provocation, that imagination is a contested field of action, not an ephemeral afterthought that we have the luxury to dismiss or romanticize, but a resource, a battleground, an input and output of technology and social order. In fact, we should acknowledge that many people are forced to live inside someone else's imagination. And one of the things we have to come to grips with is how the nightmares that many people are forced to endure are the underside of elite fantasies about efficiency, profit, and social control. Racism, among other axes of domination, helps to produce this fragmented imagination. Misery for some, monopoly for others. This means that for those of us who want to construct a different social reality, one grounded in justice and joy, we can't only critique the underside, but we also have to wrestle with the deep investments 
the desire even that many people have for social domination. I just want someone I can push around. So that's the trailer. Now let's turn to some specifics. Beginning with a relatively new app called Citizen, which sends you real-time crime alerts based on a curated selection of 911 calls. It also offers a way for users to report, live stream, and comment on purported crimes via the app. And it shows you incidents as red dots on a map, which is uh, so you can avoid particular areas, which is a slightly less racialized version of apps called Ghetto Tracker and Sketch Factor, which use public data to help people avoid dangerous neighborhoods. So some of you are probably thinking, what could possibly go wrong in the age of barbecue Beckys calling the police on black people cooking, walking, breathing out of place? It turns out that even a Stanford-educated environmental scientist living in the Bay Area, no less, is an ambassador of the carceral state calling the police on a cookout at Lake Merritt to riff off of Claudia Rankin, the most dangerous place for black people is in white people's imagination. It's worth noting, too, that the app Citizen was originally called the less chill name Vigilante. And in its rebranding, it also moved away from encouraging people to stop crime, but rather now simply to avoid it. As one member of the New York City Council put it, crime is now at historic lows in the city, but because residents are constantly being bombarded with push notifications of crime, they believe the city is going to hell in a handbasket. Not only is this categorically false, it's distracting people from very real public safety issues like reckless driving or the rising opioid use that don't show up on the app. What's most important to our discussion is that citizen and other tech fixes for social problems are not simply about technology's impact, but also about how racial norms and structures shape what tools are imagined necessary in the first place. This dynamic is what I take up in two new books. The first, examining the interplay of race automation and machine bias as an extension of older forms of racial domination. The second, an edited volume on the carceral dimensions of technology across a wide range of social arenas, from more traditional sites like policing and prisons to less obvious contexts like the retail industry, and digital service economy. As just one example from this volume, a chapter written by Madison Van Oort draws on her ethnography of worker surveillance in the retail industry, where the same companies pitching products for policing and prisons to the Department of Corrections are also pitching them to H&M and Forever 21 to track employees. And even as she shows how workers are surveilled well beyond the confines of their workplaces to include even their online activity, Van Oort also highlights how her coworkers use technology in ways that counter the experiences of alienated labor, what we might call duplicity at work. On this point, I'd like to just pause for a moment and turn to science fiction as part of expanding our sociological imagination. The clip I'm going to show you is from a film called Sleep Dealers by Alex Rivera. And it reveals in some ways how global capitalism is ever ready to turn racialized populations into automata. Mexicans, not as migrant workers, but machines that work in the US without ever setting foot in this country. So here's a clip. It's about three minutes long. In this scene, you'll see the, the character um, as he crosses the border for the first time. So you'll see he's in Mexico, but he comes to America in a new way. Cerca de la colonia donde vivía. Ciudad. Estaban las infomaquilas. Los sleep dealers.
Este es el sueño americano. Le damos a los Estados Unidos lo que siempre han querido. Todo el trabajo sin los trabajadores. José está en un matadero en Iowa. Y María es niñera de una niñita en Washington. Ustedes tres van a estar en una chambota en San Diego. Muchacho, enchúfate. Tu futuro empieza hoy. So, in this world, migrant workers are replaced by robots who are controlled virtually by laborers in Mexico, carrying out a variety of jobs in construction, agriculture, childcare, and more. Not only is the tech invasive, as we saw, but it also allows for unprecedented surveillance. So, if a worker falls asleep for an instant, the computer wakes her up, registers the lapse, and docks her pay. Amazon warehouses on steroids. Over the course of the film, Memo Cruz starts working at one such factory, which are called sleep dealers because workers often collapse of exhaustion when they're plugged into the network too long. In this way, the film reminds us how the fantasy of some is the nightmare of others, and that embodiment does not magically cease to matter with automation, but can actually become more intensified, intrusive, and violent. It's worth recalling the etymology of the Czech word robot is drawn from the Slav robata, which means servitude, hardship. And as anthropologist Kathleen Richardson observes, robots have historically been a way to talk about dehumanization. Sleep Dealers also brings to life an idea that inspired the title of my edited volume, that technology captivates fascinating, charming, and bewitching, while potentially subduing and subjugating people. To engage this tension, we have to pierce through the rhetoric and marketing of tech utopianism as we try to understand the duplicity of tech fixes, purported solutions that nevertheless reinforce and even deepen existing hierarchies. In terms of popular discourse, what got me interested in this tension was the proliferation of headlines and hot takes about so-called racist robots. A first wave of stories seemed to be shocked at the prospect that, in Langdon Winner's terms, artifacts have politics. A second wave seemed less surprised. Well, of course, technology inherits its creator's biases. And now I think we've entered a phase of attempts to override or address the default settings of racist and sexist robots, for better or worse. And one of the challenges we face is how to meaningfully differentiate technologies that are used to differentiate us. Consider the results of a recent study. Racial bias in a medical algorithm 
favors white patients over sicker black patients, reports the study by Obermeyer and colleagues in which the researchers were actually able to look inside the black box of algorithm design, which is typically not possible with proprietary systems. What's especially important to note is that the algorithm does not explicitly take note of race. That is to say, it is race neutral. By using cost to predict healthcare need, this digital triaging system unwittingly reproduces racial disparities because on average, black people incur fewer costs for a variety of reasons, including systemic racism. And in my review of the study by Obermeyer, both of which you can download from science or go to the research tab of my website, I argue that indifference to social reality on the part of tech designers and adopters can be even more harmful than malicious intent. In the case of this widely used healthcare algorithm affecting millions of people, more than double the number of black patients would have been enrolled in programs designed to help them stay out of the hospital if the predictions were actually based on need rather than cost. Race neutrality, it turns out, can be a deadly force. This combination of coded bias and imagined objectivity is what I term the new gym code. Innovation that enables social containment while appearing fairer than discriminatory practices of a previous era. This riff off of Michelle Alexander's analysis in the new Jim Crow considers how the reproduction of racist forms of social control in successive institutional forms entails a crucial socio-technical component that not only hides the nature of domination, but allows it to penetrate every facet of social life under the guise of progress. This formulation, as I highlight here, is directly related to a number of other cousin concepts by Brown, Broussard, Daniels, Eubanks, Noble, and others. And it's situated in a hybrid literature that I think of as race-critical code studies. This approach is not only concerned with the impacts of technology, but its production, and particularly how race and racism enter the process. Two works that illustrate this approach are Sophia Noble's Algorithms of Oppression, in which she argues that racist and sexist Google search results like pornographic images returned when you type in the phrase black girls grow out of a corporate logic of either willful neglect or a profit motive that makes money from racism and sexism. In a different vein, Simone Brown examines how the history of surveillance technologies reflect and reproduce distorted notions of blackness, explaining that, quote, surveillance is nothing new to black folks. From slave ships to slave patrols to airport security checkpoints and stop and frisk practices, she points to the facticity of surveillance in black life. Challenging a techno-deterministic approach, she argues that instead of seeing surveillance as something inaugurated by new technologies, to see it as ongoing is to insist that we factor in how racism and anti-blackness undergird and sustain the intersecting surveillances of our present order. And so to continue examining how anti-blackness gets encoded in and exercised through automated systems, I consider four conceptual offspring to the new Jim Code that fall along a kind of spectrum. Engineered inequity names those technologies that explicitly seek to amplify social cleavages. They are what we might think of as the most obvious, less hidden dimension of the new Jim Code. Default discrimination are those inventions that tend to ignore social cleavages and as such, tend to reproduce the de default settings of race, class, and gender, among other axes of difference. Here I want to highlight how indifference to social reality is a powerful force that is perhaps more dangerous than malicious intent. Coded exposure highlights the underside of tech inclusion, how the invisibility or technological distortion of those who are racialized is connected to our hypervisibility within systems of surveillance. And finally, techno-benevolence names those designs that claim to address bias of various sorts, but may still manage 
to reproduce or deepen discrimination in part because of the narrow way in which fairness is defined and operationalized. So for the sake of time, I'm gonna sketch the last three with a couple examples. So as I said, default discrimination includes those technologies that reinforce inequities precisely because tech designers fail to seriously attend to the social context of their work. Take, for example, carceral tools that underpin the US prison industry as a key feature of the new Jim Code. At every stage of the process, from policing, sentencing, imprisonment to parole, automated decision systems are being adopted. A recent study by investigators at ProPublica, ex uh, which many of you probably are familiar with, examined the risk scores used to predict whether individuals were likely to commit another offense once paroled. They found that the scores, which are assigned to thousands of people arrested in Broward County, Florida, were remarkably unreliable in forecasting violent crime. And they uncovered significant racial disparities and inaccuracies, the outputs of the algorithm, shall we say. But what's also concerning, I think, is how the system reinforces and hides racial domination by ignoring all the ways that racism shapes the inputs. For example, the surveys given to prospective parolees to determine how likely they are to recidivate includes questions about their criminal history, education and employment history, financial history and neighborhood characteristics, among many other factors. All of these variables have been structured in one way or another by racial domination, from job market discrimination to ghettoization. The survey measures the extent to which an individual's life has been impacted by structural racism without ever taking note of an individual's race. Colorblind codes may on the surface appear better than a biased judge or prosecutor, but crime prediction, I think, is better understood as crime production. Coded exposure in turn, in turn names the tension between ongoing surveillance of racialized people and calls for digital recognition and inclusion, the desire to literally be seen by technology. But inclusion into harmful systems is no social good. Instead, photographic exposures enable other forms of exposure and thus serves as a touchstone for considering how the act of viewing something or someone may put the object of vision at risk, a kind of scopic vulnerability that's central to the experience of being racialized. And what I'd like to underscore is that it's not only in the process of being out of sight, but also in the danger of being too centered that racialized groups are made vulnerable. So that being included is not simply positive recognition, but can be a form of unwanted exposure, but not without creative resistance, as I'll come back to in just a minute. But first, a brief interlude to illustrate the point. Hello. Motion sensors. Motioning. Motioning. Please sense me. Uh, one other thing. Lem mentioned that there's uh, something weird going on with the motion sensors in the lab. Oh, yeah. We replaced all the sensors in the building with a new state-of-the-art system that's going to save money. It works by detecting light reflected off the skin. Well, Lem says it doesn't work at all. Lem's wrong. It does work. Although there is a problem. It doesn't seem to see black people. The system doesn't see black people? I know. Weird, huh? That's more than weird, Veronica. That's basically, well, racist. The company's position is that it's actually the opposite of racist because it's not targeting black people. It's just ignoring them. They insist the worst people can call it is indifferent. Well. Nothing. We never should have let that white guy off. We're eight black men in an elevator. Of course the white guy's gonna get off. Veronica? Oh, God, this looks way too aggressive. No, it's OK. I think I know why you're all here. Well, most of you. 
Um, I have something prepared. Um, Veronica, you are a terrific boss. Thank you, Lamb. I'll take it from here. Let me start by apologizing on behalf of Viridian for this inexcusable situation. I laid into Veronica pretty good. I figured it was my only shot, so I took the gloves off. Oh, that sounds great, Lamb. Sounds like you gave the company a really strong message. Oh, yeah. She said they're working 24-7 to make things right. Can you believe this? I know, isn't it great? We all get our own free white guys. You like it? Yeah. Hey, Ty's the best. He anticipates everything I need. Plus, he picked up my dry cleaning. Oh, and he got this kink out of my neck. Really? Mm-hmm. My white guy sucks. Well, maybe you're just not using yours right. Yeah, maybe it's on you, dude. Shut up, Stu. I got the worst black guy. <laughs> It turned out Lem had also been thinking about the money issue, and he put together some interesting numbers to show us. And then, we all went to speak to management in a language they could understand. Within a margin of error of plus or minus 1%. And so, if the company keeps hiring white people to follow black people, to follow white people, to follow black people by... Thursday, June 27, 2013. Every person on Earth will be working for us. And we don't have the parking for that. No way. The reason why I love this clip is that it brilliantly depicts how a superficial corporate diversity ethos, the prioritization of efficiency over equity, and the default whiteness of tech development all work together to ensure that innovation literally produces containment. The fact that black employees are unable to use the elevators, doors, water fountains, or turn the lights on is treated as a minor inconvenience in service to a greater good. But good for whom is what we should always ask. This is the invisibilizing side of the process that Alondra Nelson describes as a dialectic of surveillance and neglect at work that characterizes black life vis-a-vis -vis science and technology. Finally, some of the most interesting developments are those we can think of as techno-benevolence that aim to address bias in various ways. Take, for example, new AI techniques for vetting job applicants. A company called HireVue aims to, quote, reduce unconscious bias and promote diversity in the workplace by using an AI-powered program that analyzes recorded interviews of prospective employees. It uses thousands of data points, including verbal and nonverbal cues like facial expression, posture, vocal tone, and compares job seekers' scores to those of existing top performing employees to decide who to flag as a desirable hire and who to reject. The sheer size of many applicant pools and the amount of time and money that companies pour into recruitment is astronomical. So companies like uh, HireVue step into the process to narrow the eligible pool at a fraction of the time and cost. And hundreds of companies worldwide have signed on, everyone from Goldman Sachs to Vodafone to Unilever to Hilton to the Atlanta public school system. Another value added, according to HireVue, is that there's a lot that a human interviewer misses that AI can keep track of to make, quote, data-driven talent decisions. After all, the problem of employment discrimination is widespread and well-documented. So the logic goes, wouldn't this be even more reason to, uh, to outsource decisions to AI? Well, a study by a team of my colleagues in computer science at Princeton examined whether a popular algorithm trained on human writing online exhibited the same racially biased tendencies that psychologists have documented among humans. In particular, they found that the algorithm associated white-sounding names with pleasant words and black-sounding names with unpleasant ones, which builds on a classic audit study that many of us teach in intro to race classes that used old school dis uh, resumes and had the same results, um, with human employers making the same association between names. So too with gender-coded words and names, as Amazon learned last year, when its hiring algorithm was found discriminating against women. 
Nevertheless, it should be clear why technical fixes that claim to bypass human biases are so desirable. If only there was a way to slay centuries of racist and sexist demons with a social justice bot. Beyond desirable, more like magical. Magical for employers, perhaps, looking to streamline the grueling work of uh, recruitment, but a curse for many job seekers. Whereas proponents describe a very human-like interaction, those who are on the hunt for jobs recount a very different experience. Applicants are frustrated not only by the lack of human contact, but also because they have no idea how they're being evaluated and why they're repeatedly rejected. One job seeker described questioning every small movement and micro expression and feeling a heightened sense of worthlessness because the company couldn't even assign a person for a few minutes. And as this headline puts it, your next interview could be with a racist robot, bringing us back to the problem space we started with. Though it's worth noting that some job seekers are already developing ways to subvert the system by trading answers to employers' tests and creating fake applications as informal audits of their own. In fact, one HR employee for a major company recommends slipping the words Oxford or Cambridge into our CVs with invisible white text to pass the automated screening. In terms of a more collective response, a federation of European trade unions called UNI Global has developed a charter of digital rights for workers, touching on automated and AI-based decisions to be included in bargaining agreements. Another development that gives me energy and optimism amidst the daily barrage of depressing headlines is that tech workers themselves have increasingly been speaking out against the most egregious forms of corporate collusion with state-sanctioned racism. For example, thousands of Google em employees condemned the company's collaboration on a Pentagon program that uses AI to make drone strikes more effective. And a growing number of Microsoft employees are, are opposed to the company's ICE contract, saying, quote, as the people who build the technologies that Microsoft profits from, we refuse to be complicit. And as this article published by Science for the People reminds us, Contrary to popular narratives, organizing among technical workers has a vibrant history, including engineers and technicians in the 60s and 70s who fought professionalism, reformism, and individualism to contribute to radical labor organizing. The current tech workers movement, which includes students across our many institutions, can draw from past organizers' experiences in learning to navigate the contradictions and complexities of organizing in tech today, and which includes building solidarity across race and class. For example, when the predominantly East African workers in the company's Minnesota warehouses organized a strike on Prime Day earlier this year, engineers from Seattle came out to support. This kind of informed refusal is certainly necessary as we build a movement to counter the new Jim Code, but we can't wait for workers' sympathies to sway the in industry. In terms of civil society, initiatives like Data for Black Lives and the Detroit Community Tech Project offer an even more expansive approach. The former brings together people working across a number of agencies and organizations in a proactive approach to tech justice, especially at the policy level. And the latter develops and uses technology rooted in community needs, offering support to grassroots networks doing data justice research, including hosting what they call discotechs, which stands for discovering technology, which are these multimedia mobile neighborhood workshop fairs that can be adapted in other locales. And I'll just mention one of the concrete collaborations that's grown out of Data for Black Lives a few years ago. Several government agencies in St. Paul, Minnesota, including the police department and the school system, formed what they call a, what was a controversial joint powers agreement called the Innovation Project, giving these agencies broad discretion to collect and share data on young people with the goal of developing predictive tools to identify, quote, at-risk youth in the city. There was immediate and broad-based backlash from the community, and in 2017, over 20 local organizations formed what they called the Stop the Cradle to Prison Algorithm Coalition. Data for Black Lives has been providing various forms of support to this group, and eventually the city of St. Paul dissolved the agreement in favor of a more community-led approach 
which was a huge victory for the activists who'd been fighting these policies for over a year. Another very tangible abolitionist approach to the new Jim Code is the Digital Defense Playbook, which introduces a set of tools for diagnosing, dealing with, and healing the injustices of pervasive and punitive data collection and data-driven systems. The playbook contains in-depth guidelines for facilitating workshops, plus tools, tip sheets, and reflection pieces crafted from in-depth interviews with communities in Charlotte, Detroit, and LA, with the aim of engendering power, not paranoia, when it comes to technology. And, when, and finally, when it comes to rethinking STEM education as the ground zero for reimagining the relationship between technology and society, there are a number of initiatives underway. And I'm just going to mention one concrete resource that you can download again, the Advancing Racial Literacy in Tech Handbook, developed by some wonderful colleagues at the Data and Society Research Institute. The aims of this intervention are threefold, to develop an intellectual understanding of how structural racism operates in algorithms, social media platforms, and technologies not yet developed, and emotional intelligence concerning how to resolve racially stressful uh, situations within organizations, and a commitment to take action to reduce harms to communities of color. The fact is, data disenfranchisement and domination has always been met with resistance and movement in which activists, scholars, and artists have sharpened abolitionist tools that employ data for liberation. This is a tradition in which, as Du Bois exclaimed, one could not be a calm, cool, and detached scientist while Negroes are being lynched, murdered, and starved. From his modernist data visualizations representing the facts of black life to Ida B. Wells Barnett's, Barnett's expert deployment of statistics in the red record, there's a long tradition of employing and challenging data for justice. Toward that end, the late legal and critical race scholar, Harvard professor Derek A. Bell, encouraged a radical assessment of reality through creative methods and racial reversals insisting that to see things as they really are, you must imagine them for what they might be, which is why I'm convinced that the arts and humanities are so vital to this discussion and this movement. One of my favorite examples of what we might call a bellion racial reversal is this parody project that begins by subverting the anti-black logics embedded in new high-tech approaches to crime prevention. Instead of using predictive policing techniques to forecast street crime, the white collar early warning system flips the script by creating a heat map that flags city blocks where financial crimes are likely to occur. The system not only brings the hidden but no less deadly crimes of capitalism into view, but it includes an app that alerts users when they've entered high risk areas to encourage citizen policing and awareness. Taking it one step further, the development team is working on a facial recognition program to flag individuals who are likely perpetrators. And the training set used to design the algorithm includes the profile photos of 7,000 corporate executives downloaded from LinkedIn. Not surprisingly, the average face of a criminal is white and male. To be sure, creative exercises like this are only comical when we ignore that all of its features are drawn directly from actually existing proposals and practices in the real world, including the use of facial images to predict criminality. By deliberately and inventively upsetting the status quo in this manner, analysts can better understand and expose the many forms of discrimination embedded in and enabled by technology. And so if, as I suggested at the start, the carceral imagination captures and contains, then a liberatory imagination opens up possibilities and pathways. It creates new settings and codes new values and builds on critical intellectual traditions that have continually developed insights and strategies grounded in justice. May we all find ways to build on this tradition. Thank you for your attention. So we, and we have to end at five, five so we're good. 
All right, so, and I also welcome, you know, some people say, don't make a comment, ask a question, but I, I welcome comments and just short, short comments. Uh, and, and um, you know, just, I, I'm really interested, as was mentioned, you know, I've been, I've been talking about this work in many, many different settings over the last few months, and it's not really satisfying to just go and talk about it without hearing how it's landing and what people are thinking about, how it relates to things that you care about, what you're researching. So you don't necessarily have to ask a pointed question. You can just share a little bit about how this is in conversation with, with what's in your own head. So as long as you keep it short. Yes, please. Yes, so I've been doing a lot of research lately around self-sovereign digital identity systems and social impact investing tied to privatized public benefit systems in which the poor, which very much disenfranchised black and brown folks have to rely on those benefit systems. Mm -hmm. And so they become data commodities mm -hmm. through various um, nodes of data extraction, mm -hmm. through education, healthcare, supportive housing, incarceration, addiction, mental health. And all of their behaviors then increasingly become coded into behavioral economics nudges. Mm -hmm. And this is being theorized right now in the state of Illinois through blockchain identity mm -hmm. systems and putting SNAP on blockchain, they haven't done it yet, but this is their headspace. Yeah. And, and so I'm trying to, and hedge fund mm. folks are, are all enmeshed in this and potentially genomic elements. Mm -hmm. There's a data zone, which wow. is in San Jose, that's linking um, half a million kids in the Bay Area, low-income kids around um, foster care, juvenile, <coughs> judicial involvement, mm. um, pre-K, yeah. um, and making these predictive analytics as data commodities, and yet I think in many respects people are being sold as your data is your commodity and your brand, and something that in sort of late stage capitalism your data assigns you value, mm -hmm. and that we're going to have pre-K apps that let children build social capital yeah. from toddlers. Wow. And I'm just curious if Whew. you or people in the room are familiar with like digital identity systems and where this is going, because I think there are folks even within the Penn system that are bumping into this. Mm -hmm. And, and, and it, it's often framed as progressive, right? Yeah. And that's, it's very challenging to come up against that. Yeah. And tell, I just feel like people shouldn't be commodified as data. Yeah. So. yeah, no, I appreciate both the kind of range of practices that are being increasingly integrated into whether it's gonna be something like a citizen score in China or an ADAR score in India. But I know that it, it's likely to start at city level, state levels. Um, and I was just, I was at a forum, community forum, on Saturday at Riverside Church in Harlem, where um, in one of the first public forums like this that I, that I had been to, in which someone approached me afterwards, was talking about a new kind of um, ID system in the city of New York that's trying to have a biometric component and trying to, but it's all always, as you said, Brandon, it's gonna make things easier, more efficient, you can gain access to things, um, but it allows an unprecedented level of access to particular people as well. So I think that idea that if you have access to something, it has access to you and understanding that the power imbalance in that. Um, and so the good news is, at least in the New York context, I see um, community organizations working to build up awareness about it. And then in that particular forum, there were all kinds of working groups that people were tackling this in different arenas. There was an education group, digital surveillance, employment, healthcare. And so in part, like my, my thinking around what to do with that, you know, that problem is to plug in to the many kinds of digital justice efforts underway that are here, I'm sure, happening in Philly. I've, in fact, I've met some people in the area who are working along these lines, maybe in this room, in fact, um, so that we can begin to, in, in the St. Paul example, where before it was actually rolled out, people got wind of it and were able to put it to a stop. It's very hard once it's already um, instituted to roll things back, but to, in some cases, track the trackers. So the St. Paul group is developing um, tools and a webinar that people in other locales can learn from their experience in order to start building the infrastructure to, to be able to see these things before they're, uh, you know, adopted by city governments. Um, this summer, the NAACP at their national meeting passed a resolution 
that opposed linking blockchain identity to any public benefit systems. Yeah, that's across. great. So to know. having that as a model, if anyone is working in that space, that's great. To I think know. it would be great. Yeah, and I'm I've been heartened to see the NAACP um, education defense and uh, legal f and the education fund co-sponsoring a number of things that I've gone to the Riverside Forum and a number of other things. So it's good to see organizations that have their purview hasn't necessarily encompassed emerging technologies, understanding the stakes and, and moving into this. Yes? Um, Professor Benjamin, so I'm a medical student um, and doing research here at Penn this year. Uh, recently, a paper was published um, linking uh, proximity, proximity to um, police shooting of unarmed black men with preterm birth, um, specifically of black babies. Yeah. Um, and as someone interested in the medical humanities and social sciences, I kind of watched sort of like two, like two stories being mm -hmm. reacted to on my media, mm -hmm. social media timeline where my medical student and physician, um, like people that I follow mm -hmm. were excited about the study that yeah. is adding additional data to issues of health disparities yeah. as we often sort of like beat this drum but then my friends who are in the humanities were basically rolling their eyes, like, do we need another one of these studies? Mm -hmm. um, and some were actually citing your work as to <laughs> the sort of like over identification mm -hmm. of issues of yeah. inequality. And I was wondering whether you had any comment about the, you know, studies that yeah. use publicly available data yeah. um, to link injustices yeah. to health outcomes, like the sort of like a both a critique and yeah. or I don't know, a commentary on those. Yeah, no, I saw that when that was published. And I also saw a different set of controversies around um, the citation practices of, of that study and not um, citing a, the one of the most well-known scholars, Abigail Sewell, who's been working on, on these neighborhood effects on health. Um, but so I do, I and it comes across quite strongly in the book, my just impatience um, with calls for more data about things that we know so much about and that we could address yesterday. Um, and so I talk about it in terms of the kind of perversion of knowledge or perversion of data, where it, it becomes uh, the call for more information or data becomes a way of uh, eliciting inaction <laughs> on things. Um, so I do feel strongly about that. but. Just because I, in, in the case of this study, just because I feel, um, yeah, we, we know this. We know the social determinants of health. We know all of these various pathways to, whether it's reproductive health or other things. Um, I, I also respect the fact that in certain fields, um, people can use that in ways that I don't necessarily foresee to make certain kinds of claims and advance certain kinds of agendas. So just because things seem settled or over over studied in my corner of the world, I don't presume to know that that particular you know study could have a, 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 a impact in someone else's field where they need particular kinds of data or information. It has to be quantitative, it has to be this or that. And so, um, I don't have a direct comment on the excitement that people may rightly have around this to be able to prove some point that they've the case that they've been trying to make. But when I step back in a kind of larger zoom out, you know, I mean, part of me questions like who the audience for research is. And so, for example, with this book that I've written, I could have written a book that the odd primary audience was, let's say, tech companies. How to how to tweak your algorithm in 12 days, hire me, you know, like something that was, you know, much geared to become a, you know, premier consultant within Silicon Valley or something, you know? And so as in contrast to that, I wanted to develop a tool that can arm community organizations, provide a language for people doing tech justice work, um, add, you know, something that they could use in their toolkit to advance certain kinds of organizing agendas, education agendas, et cetera. And so in some ways, I think we have to ask of any study, who is the audience? And maybe for my audience that I you know, know and love, that's an that's a eye roll moment. You know, like, oh, we didn't know that. We needed to spend $3 million on that to do, you know. Um, but it could be facing in a different direction for another audience that it is having a kind of impact that I am not necessarily invested in. And so the way that I distinguish that is to say, in some cases, we're producing research to prove what is. 
Um, and in others, uh, and that's why I spend so much time on imagination, I also want us to think about what is possible, having a more aspirational, anticipatory um, approach to world building, not just simply describing the world that it exists already. I hope that's helpful. Yeah. Yes. Hi, yes. Hi. Uh, wonderful talk. <laughs> and um, So I'm at Drexel, uh -huh. and this is a question not about AI, but uh -huh. about the issue of surveillance, and particularly mm -hmm. of, of black bodies. Yeah. Um, and it's about the cell phone. <laughs> and and, knowledge, and computers and knowledge and belief that and, and criminal and the criminal justice yeah. not injustice and surveillance mm -hmm. and so we get all these alerts from Drexel police about mm. crime mm -hmm. and it can be very irritating mm -hmm. and it's always description it's like mm -hmm. black person mm -hmm. male <laughs> mm -hmm. A backpack, a hoodie, mm -hmm. and every black male person on the campus is like, "Oh, that's me." Mm -hmm. <laughs> and students are like, up, rightfully upset, as faculty and staff, who mm -hmm. a few of us who are mm -hmm. black and male, and and um, but then the cops just say that <coughs> that's what they tell us, mm -hmm. and we have to say what they say. Mm -hmm. And then, but the students are like, "Well, other crime is happening, and y'all are not." Sending those alerts out, mm -hmm. and so my question is, how would do you think we should handle that? Yeah, that is a mil one of those very, very relevant uh, questions that affect all of our institutions. I know, at least at Princeton, a few of my colleagues, in particular, a few of my white colleagues, went and met with the um, the the office, the security office, and insisted that they take that racial description out of the of the alerts. And so I don't know if that would matter if, you know, people may Im superimpose, you know, who they think it is based on however many years of doing doing that, but that that is in some ways a quick fix that um, like, you know, smooths the surface, but I don't think necessarily gets at the underlying um, dynamics that you're describing of this heightened sense of alert and awareness and looking for danger in, in particular bodies. So I don't have a great answer. I just know that what, you know, some of my, in fact, one of the only white person in African American studies was behind that and we, we supported her. And I think it was important that she be the one to do that too. Yeah. Yes. Hi. So thanks for having a I was wondering, just like given your past work where you've done more comparative work, yeah. uh, if you had any comments on how this intersection between race and technology works outside of the US, particularly where, I mean, say skin tones don't so easily mm -hmm. map on. I mean, you, you've done work in South Africa, India, mm -hmm. so those yeah. places where there is racism and there is a yeah. great fascination with technical fixes, yeah. but you can't. <laughs> as easily distinguish yeah. the light skin from the dark. Absolutely. And one of, you know, I'm in conversation with other scholars who are who are doing similar kinds of work in particular regions where whatever the socially salient, you know, fault lines are, they're looking at how that intersects with the development of these emerging technologies. When I was in um, Nairobi over the summer talking to an uh, international conference of, Af you know, African data scientists, I was looking for a sort of examples that were closer to home. And one of the areas that was, and many of you may be familiar with, is just the role of financial technologies, fintech, throughout the world, but the particular way it's taking shape um, uh, in, in different parts of Africa. And, and the forms of digital debt or digital peonage or you know, however you want to think about it. One of my colleagues calls it algorithmic colonialism. When you start to look at the companies that are based in the U.S. that go and you know market these apps where there's easy, um, uh, easy access to um, capital, um, again, as someone mentioned, it's completely framed as banking the unbanked, you know, financial empowerment, all of the great buzzwords. And when you look, you know, at what's really happening on the ground and the, how people who are using these apps are are experiencing it. There's a, a group of researchers, in fact, um, if you look, the title of one of the articles that I read in preparation for that was from, um, 
from Silicon Savannah, which is a term used, right, for Kenya, from Silicon Savannah to, um, oh, whatever the bad version of that is. Um, <laughs> so, so something colonialism. Um, but it goes into this in quotes, and it's based on extensive, and I'm sure the full study will come out soon. But I, I just think we have to think about what are the existing forms of inequity, oppression, power, and we just need much, many more scholars, thinkers, advocates to make these connections. There are already so many that I'm in conversation with, but I don't purport this idea of the new Jim Code or my analysis in race after technology to be some general theory of innovation and inequity. I'm really encouraging younger scholars in particular to, you know, join the conversation, do, you know, find different field sites, look at different regional forms that this is taking. Um, because it's, it's a global phenomenon, but there's these very specific configurations of which companies, which fault lines, which government policies. If you look, for example, at the way that um, China collaborated with, what, Zimbabwe, right, um, to uh, roll out a vast, um, you know, digital infrastructure there in order to then collect all this biometric data to make its facial recognition system more diverse by populating it with darker skin. This exchange between government and company that the people had no say in. But now, and again, it's all wrapped in the language of inclusion. Now our facial recognition system is more adept at identifying individuals who are darker skin than those US-based facial recognition systems. And so there's so much happening that even much more that I even don't even know about, but we really have to think beyond, I think, the US context. And that's in some way what I was trying to do by wetting your appetite with the Alex Rivera clip is to begin to imagine beyond these boundaries and beyond the, the, the racial taxonomy that we understand. Yeah. Yes, please. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, you got to talking about capitalism in one of your later examples mm -hmm. with the white collar early warning system. I'm just wondering if I could hear more of your thoughts on that because more than just technology as a way to edit out social bias, it's mm -hmm. also the, the justification is well, there's scarce resources and mm -hmm. we need the best, most objective way to allocate yeah. them. Yeah. And I'm particularly thinking of the, the higher view example. Mm -hmm. And so how does, um, how does just like the, the fundamental demands of capitalism fuel mm -hmm. these same sorts of technical innovations and then, and and what answer would you have to people who just say we're just trying to allocate scarce resources? Yeah. No, I think that that particular um, ideology and justification for so many of these technologies, it's, it's, one of like, it's like the, one of the three or four pillars. I think about it as kind of algorithmic austerity, you know, kind of justifying various kinds of austerity measures and using algorithms to make these decisions. One of the examples that's really, um, um, dramatic is in the state of Michigan, where then Governor Snyder, who was also the governor who oversaw the Flint water, oversaw the Flint water poisoning, adopted an automated decision system called Midas to make decisions and to, to flag people who were likely um, perpetrators of unemployment fraud. And the promise was that this is going to be more efficient. It's going to save the state money. We're going to be able to recoup all this money that we're not getting. It was all about the, the, the economic benefit to the state and the efficiency. So very little human oversight for several years. Flagged over 40,000 people. Um, people uh, paid back tens of thousands of dollars in fines, went bankrupt, lost their homes, committed suicide, filed for divorce affecting millions of, I mean, sorry, thousands of people. And we learn after the fact that this Midas system was wrong in 93% of the cases that yet was wreaked havoc on people's lives. And so anytime I think we're faced with um, pronouncements of savings, we think about the human toll, the, the state actually in that time period, its coffers exploded, you know? So it didn't, it, the promise was met. But for whom, who's benefiting economically? And certainly not all of those tens of thousands of people who were flagged and, and marked by that. Um, they did not see any economic benefit. In fact, quite the opposite. Now, there's a class action lawsuit against the state brought against that particular. But you know, I mean, what can you give people back, really? 
after all of that. Um, and that's one of many examples where we have to call the lie that it is, right? And say, yeah, on one level, it may meet this promise for whatever entity is rolling out this system. Again, in, in New York in 2017, it was one of, the, one of the first or the first municipality to create this automatic decision system task force to essentially even just um, identify all of the ADS systems that the city already uses. And I got, when I went to the forum on Saturday, I got this package that listed all of these different systems that I had, I mean, the average person would not even know that this, behind the decision about whether they got this benefit or don't, get this housing or don't, that there's this ADS system. And so it was, it took so long just to, and even now there was a shadow report that was written um, uh, contesting the official report of this task force because even still it's not surfaced all of the ways this basic level of information just for citizens to know what is being used, not even to begin to question it or contest it or whatever. Just that basic information tells us that, you know, um, there are the, the, the discourse around things being open and transparent and efficient and all of that, you know, is often masking um, various kinds of, of practices that I think we have a right, <laughs> we have to demand in, to, to have this information as a first step for organizing. And so that's a kind of windy way to say that this is a huge, a huge dimension of what we're talking about. But there are people, organizations that, again, that I can point to that are addressing this in meaningful ways. There's a, a growing movement around um, platform cooperativism as a counter to platform capitalism. If you go to platformcoop.com, I believe, you can look at experiments that are already underway to, to create a cooperative model around digital platforms. There's a community technology, um, what's the, uh, co cooperative in New York that's this kind of umbrella organization that's about building this a, a, a digital ecosystem where the, who, who's developing and owning, uh, you know, the, the actual, um, the infrastructures in, in, in a more participatory mode and not monopolized by tech companies. And so there's a lot underway. And if you look at the resources tab of my website, it gives you a, a glimpse of some of that. It's not exhaustive, but just to give you a sense of where you can begin to plug in and think about this. Yeah. Yes, please. I have a, a couple comments, yeah, sure. uh, which yeah. I'd love to hear your comments yeah, on. Sure. <laughs> and and they're, they relate to aspects of your talk that others have raised mm -hmm, already. Mm -hmm. So one is about the uh, biological mm -hmm. and um, the ways in which biological approaches can affect the types of interventions and mm -hmm. solutions. Mm -hmm. And so I, I really appreciated your comment that uh, there are various ways in which these uh, bioscientific mm -hmm. approaches to inequality might uh, either harm or help. Mm -hmm. It, depending on the audience. Mm -hmm. um, but I wanted to highlight that there's a way in which biosocial approaches mm -hmm. tend to produce suggestions for biological interventions. Mm -hmm. And also I wonder if, even if they do produce more socially oriented mm -hmm. solutions, that then there will be a biological test mm -hmm. for those solutions. <laughs> Um, yeah. and, and, and then, and, and even more so, what I'm really interested in is what connection you see between your work mm -hmm. critiquing biosocial science and what you talked about today, mm -hmm. because your talk today didn't focus mm -hmm. on biology, but even the comment over here pointed out that DNA testing is being linked to many of these data collection mm -hmm. Um, procedures. So I, I, I really love to hear what you have to say about yeah. those connections. And the other was um, to highlight what you were saying about how despite the fact that civil rights orientation toward racial inequality has tended to be about black people being excluded, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. uh, there's also a way in which inclusion mm -hmm. can be racist and support white supremacy mm -hmm. and harm mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I, I've been really interested in how 
so much exciting work now is pointing out that inclusion. So I'm thinking of Virginia Eubanks' mm -hmm. book, Automating Inequality, mm -hmm. where she points out that the problem isn't poor people being excluded, it's that they're being included. Yeah, in the testing uh, ground for so many other Yeah, the things. testing yeah. ground, mm -hmm. and the, that all of these systems are automa automated decision-making systems are figuring out how to include yeah. people in poverty in order to harm them in some way, right? Yeah, um, and then also your wonderful colleague, Kianga mm -hmm. uh, Taylor's concept of predatory That's inclusion, right. yeah. where she points out that racist capitalism yeah. is not just about excluding black people, it's about including mm -hmm. black people in predatory types of yeah. um, systems. Yeah. And uh, so I wondered if you absolutely. And in fact, too. almost every time I get a chance, I get to the point where I'm talking about predatory inclusion and drawing on Kianga's formulation yeah. in a completely different context. You know, right. she's talking about in the context of housing policy and discrimination, but mm -hmm. it truly applies here. When we think about you know the calls for um, you know if you think a few weeks ago. Uh, Google hired contract workers to uh, make its new Pixel 4 phone, so uh, divert, uh, create the training data to make it so that the facial recognition for the phone would work on darker skin by hiring contract workers to target homeless people in Atlanta, specifically black homeless people, and give them $5 gift cards and ask them to play around with a phone to get their picture without really telling them what it was for. And the contract workers blew the whistle and went to the news media. And that whole scenario, there's so many layers to it, but one is this idea that um, developing an inclusive product can rest on a coercive process, that the process doesn't matter. And what those in tech justice are demanding is that the process matters. Not only does the process matter, in terms of who's doing the designing through what, you know, who's around all the, the who's around the table type of things. But, and this relates to your first question, uh, point, mm -hmm. which is that real power is being able to define the problem space that technology is asked to solve. It's not even having some input in the middle area. It's being able to say that this is what we want the technology to solve, and in that conversation, in leaving open the possibility that we might not even need technology to solve it. So to me, that is a true test of whether you have true informed refusal or informed consent, is whether you can truly opt out or truly put a stop to whatever development is happening. And so I think one of the ways that I see, and it kind of relates to the three points, is that we are, we're struggling over who defines the problem space that all of these things are happening in as, as, a, as a ground zero? Mm -hmm. And that relates to the bio question. And, and so, you know, there are, you know, efforts now. We have bans on facial recognition in a number of cities throughout the U.S., from San Francisco to Somerville, Massachusetts. So those are examples where, you know, there, people have said, you know, we, we don't want that. We don't want government use of this, police use of this. But in Oregon, it's one of the first places that I know of in which the state is uh, c uh, considering a law that would not allow even private entities to use facial recognition, which takes it even a step further. Um, and so it's, all of that to me connects up to this issue of predatory inclusion and people being savvy about this idea and seeing through the lie that you know diversity and inclusion in tech means that we are included in an agenda that you have set. So I think that that, that is becoming more of a common sense starter. Mm -hmm. Then when we begin to think about, and I will say my next project is going to move back into um, um, thinking about the relationship between genetics, genetic technologies, and what I've worked on here. And as to get started, and I'll end with this because I know everyone's getting tired, um, one of the formulations that I've been thinking about to connect this is going back historically to look at um, you know, the way that science and technology has um, predicted the risk of individuals in oppressive situations and contexts and institutions. And I'm looking at um, you know, Samuel Cartwright's work around drapetomania and, and really thinking about you know, this process of in, an, in a context in which a society 
is a slave society, and then saying that the problem is really that these individuals, they want to run away. Why do they want to run away? And pathologizing that desire to run away by coining a medical term that was published in the leading journals of the time called drapetomania, which was a mental condition that caused the enslaved to run away, according to a famed physician at the time. Trained at Penn. Trained at Penn. There you go. So this is your history. All right. So if we take that as a historical you know, um, touchstone, one of the ways that I think about the use of risk assessment tools today, because in many ways he was predicting the risk of the enslaved to run away. Oh, it's empty, don't worry. And so it was a predictive, a predictive diagnosis, right? So we think today about all of these risk assessment tools in the context of finance, of you know, policing, et cetera. I liken them to a digital drapetomania. They are focused on the wrong thing. Rather than looking at the riskiness of individuals under unjust conditions, we need to turn the lens, the technological, the social, the analytical lens, to the production of risk by institutions, whether that institution be healthcare or um, you know, finance or education, rather than to individuals who are trying to survive in that context, as the enslaved were trying to do. And so when we do that, we come up with things like the white collar early warning system. Or we come up with a real example of that called the anti-eviction mapping project. Rather than trying to predict individuals' likelihood of defaulting on rent or something, you're looking at the, le the, the, at the practices of land landlords and housing across the, across the country. And so for those who want an example of what I see as a more liberatory approach to data collection and, and circulation, and it is this anti-eviction mapping process where you turn the lens onto those who are creating precarity and pre cre creating a situation in which people are just trying to survive. And so I'm gonna end there, and I'm gonna urge you all to jump on and, and contribute to this process. Thank you.